This is a Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning entertainment podcast that's out every single week. This week, we are introducing you to our new true crime podcast. It also has a little connection to movies. It's called Inspired by a True Story. This is Aaron Peterson, your host. I just want to introduce Inspired by a True Story. You're going to hear the story of Scream, and while you think it might be just about movies, it's not. We're actually looking at the crimes that inspired some of our favorite movies and entertainment today. Uh, there are three episodes currently out. This is the fourth. There's uh, another one next week. Obviously, they're coming. It typically, is going to run every two weeks. Uh, but the first five weeks are week to week just to get the podcast out there and get people excited. This is one that's perfectly timed for this time of year as we look at Scream and what inspired Kevin Williamson to write one of the most prolific and memorable horror movies of the last three decades. So joining me for this podcast are Amanda Sink and John Davenport. And yes, there are jokes, there's humor, there's a lot of dire dourness too, because we're, we're kind of looking at both sides of it. We are looking at what the horrors are that inspired this, the very, very horrific acts that inspired this particular movie, and also the movie and its legacy. And what does that mean to to celebrate a film about slashers that also was inspired by a slasher and it's called inspired by a true story it's in your podcast feed spotify apple Podcasts, whatever you listen to go find it there subscribe if you like it review it because that helps you know be seen by by other listeners that are trying to find it and you are our best source of promotion by far thanks again and i'm gonna go ahead and just let it roll this is inspired by a true story and we're gonna talk about scream and the inspiration for scream which was danny rolling aka the Gainesville Ripper. November 1991. Danny Rowland is charged with five counts of murder. Crimes that occurred over the course of four days in August 1990 in Gainesville, Florida. He became known as the Gainesville Ripper. In 1996, Wes Craven unleashed a new slasher film that flipped horror on its ear and launched a new franchise. This film was written by Kevin Williamson who drew his inspiration from the crimes of one Daniel Harold Rowland. Because Scream was inspired by a true story. How's that? Is that like a sexy murdery voice? Yeah, that was pretty hot. Sweet. Welcome to True Crime for Cinephiles. This is Inspired by a True Story, a podcast devoted to keeping artists honest. There are two pieces to this podcast, the crime itself and the movie or TV series that inspired. So we're going to discuss the overall details of the actual crime. Also review the film on its own and how much of that movie is true versus how much is actually Hollywood magic. I'm Aaron Peterson, an accredited film critic for the Hollywood Outsider podcast and website and devoted true crime follower. Joining me today are my fellow film critics and true crime devotees, John Davenport. How you doing, Johnny? I'm doing great. How are you doing tonight, Aaron? Doing okay. Uh, I mean, not after this necessarily. I kind of feel like I need a bath, but... Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. This is this is not going to be a pretty picture. The crimes themselves are pretty hard. It's sad because I love the Scream franchise. I love the Scream franchise. But, you know, we still got to talk about this. That's just the whole point of the podcast. And also joining us is someone who is ranked Scream as one of her favorite horror movies of all time, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. We hath returned. How are you? I think you summarized it well. I feel dirty. I need to shower. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you know, and we're going to talk about the crimes, but people that have no experience with this that have never heard about what inspired Scream, you're in for, not for a treat, you're in for a really, really, a really sad ride through- A rude awakening. Yeah, perfectly that timed will, to Halloween, I might add. It will crumble everything that you thought you loved about a movie franchise and take you into reality. I kind of can't wait to get to that point. I really want to go through you know, what happened here, uh, which is so far is the hardest one to go through. But I want to get through that so we can talk about, does this change your opinion on 
slasher movies and things like that. I mean, it's it's interesting. Why do we love things like this when things like this happen? And things even much worse yeah. than what we saw on screen happen. Oh, man. this Scream, Scream was a Disney film compared to this, <laughs> really. Yeah. I mean, truly, <laughs> I was shooketh. I don't think that, I don't think that's a term. I was it, it is for this podcast. It's a term. It's a term that actually you can look it up. Shooketh is a, the proper tense for what this was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right under the Di- Danny Rowling picture, huh? Yeah. Mm. Now raise your your vocal cords if you knew this story before we rehearsed for the podcast because I knew that it was inspired by something horrible. I did not know the details. Uh, you guys. I seem to remember that it was it, so it didn't surprise me to hear that it was, uh, but I didn't remember it being so close to home for me. Oh yeah, that's that's a good point, Mister Florida man. I did not know in these details. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have rewatched Scream as much as I did. To be fair, it's just because I, it takes a different look for me. Like I, I just emotionally, ethically, and morally am struggling. With that reality. Yeah, it makes a lot of things change in your head a little bit, you know? It does, but at at least, and this is going to sound really terrible, but I'm glad that they didn't depict, you know, fully and transfer the whole crimes into the movie franchise. I I think it's fair to say that a lot of what you see is completely different from what actually happened. Like, the what inspired it is not what you see in the movie, mostly. Yeah, I would agree. I I don't think it's going to make me enjoy Scream as a series any less, but I do think when I watch it going forward, especially the first movie, you know, the sequels get further and further away from anything that the first one had to do. So I really feel like it's going to kind of taint how I rewatch Scream the next time I do. Yeah, you're going to be thinking about it. Yeah. Not me. I'll be fine. (laughs) Fair point. All right. Hey, well, that's dark. Everybody, no, it's, <laughs> no, it's not dark. That's honest. That's fair. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a movie. It's still its own thing. It's not right. It shouldn't be like tainted yeah, by yeah, that's this. True. That's it, true. That's true. You either true. like it, the movie, or you don't. When we get to the part where we start talking about the comparisons, I'll explain why it's not going to bother me. Yeah. When they take real crime and they make it hyper violent just for style sake and and really has nothing to do with the substance and there were actual real victims that's harder for me to stomach than something like this where it inspired fake crimes you know what i mean like these crimes aren't really anything similar to what happened completely maybe i'm trying to justify my own fandom (laughs) of slash effects no i think you have a valid point and and i guess that's all we'll say right now until we get into the full conversation because people probably want to know what the heck we're talking about? Yes. Because most people don't know about the real crime. As I we know. Said. Yeah, this is called front loading the whole discussion <laughs> right at this point. How many people we lose yeah. just with this long, we long are tease? Foreshadowing. You're welcome. Uh, you're, you are welcome. So let's get into it. This is a pretty brutal one, far more terrifying than anything actually witnessed in the Scream film or series. Before we get there, new episodes are released every two weeks and can be found wherever you listen to podcasts. I do want to preface, this is a, a new podcast, so for the first five weeks, it's going to be week to week uh, until we get those out, and then we'll be going to every two weeks. We just want to make sure that we get something consistent so you can subscribe, but then we're going to be going to every two weeks. So don't be surprised when you're like, why didn't one come out this week? They quit already? No, we didn't. Relax. It's okay. Uh, but you can find them anywhere you listen to podcasts or at thehollywoodoutsider.com or you can go to inspiredbyatruestory.com. It's just going to take you to the same website. You can also hear episodes early by supporting the show at patreon.com slash thehollywoodoutsider. There's a lot of bonus content there too. And for those who might not have seen Scream, Wes Craven direct. All right. You know what, Amanda? This is a big movie for you. Why don't you, why don't you explain what Scream is? Ooh. So, yeah, for anybody who's not familiar, which I guess shame on you. How have you missed out on this big piece of pop culture? (laughs) Wes Craven directed this 1996 film, and it was written by Kevin Williamson. And it follows Nev Campbell, Sidney Prescott, a year after her mother's death, when a series of murders begins taking place in the town of Woodsboro. 
There are many suspects, including Sydney's boyfriend, Billy Loomis, and his friend, Stu, and they're being investigated by Deputy Dewey and Gail Weathers, who is a fun character here. The film did lead to a series of films that are still ongoing today. Um, um, We've got another one coming out, I think, in like a year or something, so it's definitely not ended by any means. Film and true crime fans alike are always debating how factual their true crime is. So let's investigate Danny Rowling and the film, his crimes inspired, Scream. Here are the overall details of the crime, and please be warned, these crimes contain violence and sexual assault, and this podcast is intended for a mature audience. August 24th, 1990. Danny Rowling had set up a campsite near the campus of the University of Florida in Gainesville. Incoming freshmen, 18-year-old Sonia Larson and 17-year-old Christina Powell, were headed home unaware that they were being followed. Danny slipped into their shared home that night. When he entered, he found Christina Powell asleep on the downstairs couch. He made a conscious choice to move past Christina, for now, and headed upstairs. Here he found Sonia Larson, also asleep. He taped her mouth shut with duct tape to silence her screams, before he brutally stabbed Sonia to death with a Marine K-Bar knife. The crime scene would later show that Sonia had attempted to fight her attacker off. After he murdered Sonia, Rowling headed back downstairs to Christina Powell. Again, he taped her mouth shut before tying her hands together behind her back and using her knife to disrobe her. Rowling raped Christina before stabbing her in the back multiple times. Later, he returned to Sonia's dead body and sodomized her as well. Before Rowling left the crime scene, he posed the corpses of Sonia Larson and Christina Powell in provocative poses, and then he showered. The next day was August 25th, 1990. Rowling finds another victim, and this was even more savage. Krista Hoyt was an 18-year-old chemistry honor student enrolled at Santa Fe College, which was near the University of Florida. Rowling broke into her apartment by using a screwdriver to pry open a sliding glass door and was shocked to find she was not home. But Rowling waited. Around 11 a.m., Krista Hoyt returned home and was surprised by Rowling, who attacked her and once again duct taped her mouth shut before tying her hands behind her back and forcing her into the bedroom. He once again cut the victim's clothes off before raping her. He cut off her nipples, and then he stabbed her in the back. He also sliced her abdomen open from the pubic area to her breasts. Rowling then left and returned to his campsite, but once he could not find his wallet, he returned to the crime scene. It was at this time that he then decapitated Krista and then posed her in a sitting position on the bed, pulled a shelf over by her corpse, placed her head on that shelf to face her own corpse. And Rowling still wasn't done. The murders began to terrify the students, and many immediately withdrew enrollment or transferred. Others had sleepovers to keep each other safe. Unfortunately, there were still two victims yet to be claimed. On August 27th, 
Manuel, a.k.a. Manny Tabota, and Tracy Paulus, both 23, were roommates asleep in separate rooms. Rolling again, Pride opened their sliding glass door and broke in. As he found Manny in bed asleep, Rowling attempted to kill him, but Manny was able to fight, which awakened Tracy. Manny, though he tried, eventually succumbed to his injuries. But the struggle alerted Tracy that Roland was in the apartment. Tracy ran back to her bedroom and tried to barricade herself in the room, but it wasn't enough. Roland broke through the door, and once inside, he repeated his previous crimes by taping her mouth shut and then tying Tracy's hands, cutting off her clothes, raping her, and then stabbing her in the back. Rowling then posed Tracy's body yet again, but he left Manny where he murdered her. All of his female victims were tiny brunettes with brown eyes. The names of the students were memorialized on a panel of the quarter-mile-long 34th Street graffiti wall in Gainesville, titled Remember 1990. Investigator Don Maines elaborated on the posing of the victims. He said, This killer had a style about him. He would draw the victims to the edge of the bed and then leave them in a spread-eagle position in their final resting place. Unfortunately, that's not where the story ends. Despite the crimes ending there. The most horrific part of all of this, at least in my opinion, is how real and plausible it is that this could happen to anybody, like anyone, any single person, and how demented and uh, just like a psychological torturer that this individual is and was. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's the worst. It's like it turns your stomach thinking about the things that he th- he had to have thought through to make this all happen, to make this crime scene look the way it did. Yeah. And there's more to talk about but before we get there. So you're as, as a woman, right? I, I feel like men walk around a little bit more assuredly in some respects because we figure no one's stalking us. Is that a fair sum? Am I fa- saying that fairly? John, I would say that's pretty accurate. We do have a we do have the ability of walking just about wherever we want and not have to worry about it because we never make the assumption that somebody is looking for us. And, and I, well, I know that for a woman that is not as innocent, right? So, Amanda, as as a woman, when you hear cases like that, and I assume you already are, but does it change how you walk home? Does it change how you you do you go about your daily life? I don't even think that the case is relevant to doing that. I think just growing up as a woman, as a female individual, you automatically learn to check your surroundings, to look at who's watching you, to look at who's following you, to make sure that you take a different path every time, to make sure that your your music is never too loud if you're out walking and you have headphones on, you keep one out or... You know, you always have your cell phone handy. Make sure that you hold your keys where you have a key available that you can stab someone in the eye if you need to. Make sure you have your pepper spray. Make sure that you don't grab anything off of your car because it could have something on it and they could try to take you. Like all of those things are such an innate part of being a female. And I say that as someone who was attacked in an elementary school as a woman and like, you just have to learn that real young. Everybody does. And it doesn't matter if you experienced it or if your friend experienced it or if you're just, you see a girl who you don't know who's a stranger who's experiencing it. Like, you know. So these cases just more so reinforce what would happen and could happen to you. And it's not even a matter of if you're prepared or not, because you can only ever be so prepared, right? Like, you, these these women were not at fault, by any means. No, of course not. And even if they've had like full preparation, all the self-defense classes or a gun or, you know, all of these different things that could, quote unquote, could have helped them, there's never a guarantee that that's going to be enough. So you always have to consider everything at all times. 
Yeah, that's the thing is that when I was listening to these cases again, they were all killed at home. The one place where they should be feeling safe, the one place where they yeah. should feel like they just shouldn't have to have to live that life, the one place they're they're inside their four walls and they're they should be okay. But that unfortunately wasn't the case because Danny found his way in. It really makes you think because I can't tell you how many times where I don't know, I forgot to to lock a door or the sli- I came home and the sliding glass door was open. And whoever forgot it, myself or my wife, I don't know. It really doesn't matter. Especially when you hear cases like this, you think of all the things that could have happened because of that. You can't plan for everything. You just you just can't. And when he hit these victims uh, back to back to back, I mean, that is a, a level of insanity. I mean, it rivals Ted Bundy, which I know later he said he wanted to be compared to, but it does rival like Ted Bundy's spree that he had in the college areas. Nobody could have forecast this nobody could have seen this coming i mean he came out of nowhere these poor women had no idea he was watching them most likely from behind their house as they were getting ready for bed or whatever they were doing and the community really you know we didn't have the internet as prevalent in 1990 as it is now you know there'd be so many warnings about there'd been bodies found blah blah blah, blah. so it would be blowing up and people would be panicked and locking everything so it was making its way around the campus but there still were people that didn't know about it or weren't sure exactly how to how to handle that what it meant how gross and grotesque these murders were another part of that is when you have someone okay so you have someone who murders their first victim which happened on the 24th no, it wasn't his first victim situation. but the first in this series yes yeah first in the series yeah. and that happens and most people who have at least maybe some humanity left in them they're going to take a step and they're going to be like, whoa, you know, maybe what did I do? Or, um, you know, at least trying to be more precautious and things like that. He he had a high from it. And that's why he kept doing it back to back to back because he couldn't wait. And that's like real sick when you think about that, Mm -hmm. that he he enjoyed it so much that he had to do it again and repeat his ritual. And he even beheaded one of his victims and putting her on a shelf, dragging a shelf over to her body to put her head on it, to look at her corpse is almost just to defile her even further than he already had. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. a sickness that God, you know, you, you've been in psychology for a long time. I know psychology. I mean, a lot of people know psychology. I don't, I can't for the life of me understand that. Uh, I just, the level of depravity in someone's mind to do those things. It's just not something I can understand. I've tried. Tried, you, you know, you want to understand, especially if you have a, a respect and a and a concern for the mentally ill. You you want to understand those things so we can improve and make it better. If you see the signs later on, I don't know what signs you'd see with some behavior. I mean, we're going to get to some of his signs, but what he actually did, I don't know. If, how don't, you could predict how you something predict to that. that level. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how you predict that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, like I said, that's not where the story ends. Despite those crimes ending there, there's more. So what the police rarely talk about is that they did identify two suspects. One was cleared, and one was Edward Lewis Humphrey, who was also a University of Florida student and had a history of mental illness, and he had several facial scars stemming from a car accident. Humphrey was arrested after a physical altercation with his grandmother and then held in custody for five months until a grand jury refused to indict him on the murders due to lack of evidence. His photo was shown throughout this time, effectively branding him the killer without proving it. The blood type was identified as type B for the killer later on, but Edward had type A. Still, you know how the police are. Before we move on, I do want to talk about that. In this case, and a lot of documentaries, very little is made about that. But this guy was basically fingered as the killer for a good portion of a year. And actually, it wasn't until some randomness a year and a half later that they actually caught up to Rowling. Now, we talk about 
innocent people being convicted of crimes and da da da. In this day and age, I think it would be the same thing, don't you? That the public would condemn him to death before they were sure. It would be not only just the people who are aware of the story within the area, but it would be everyone on the planet and TikTok who are creating uh, whodunits or whatnot, and they're trying to get their flash in the pan amount of of fame by being able to tell stories about who might have done something it would be on such a level that there would that the guy's life would essentially be destroyed the only thing i would i guess call out in this situation is maybe just to add a little perspective i guess and this is not me saying that i understand and especially not in today's age but blood dna testing and analysis and all of that was still when you think about it in terms of timeline relatively new sure like it it had it hadn't been out for that long where right now if you told us that someone was type b and the killer was type b and that the individual was type a we'd be like oh, okay absolutely 100 percent couldn't be this individual then back then it might have been more like well, like, do you know for sure? How valid are the tests? Like, how do we know for sure? And so when you think about a a jury trying to indict somebody, I can see I can see why some people might have leaned on him potentially being the killer in spite of some of that information. Not that I agree or that it's right or anything like that. Sure. I I get that. You, You catch him, the murder stop. You know, he's got these very uh, hideous scars on his face. Okay. You know, whatever. But the evidence isn't there. And they held him for five months because he, he got into a physical altercation with his grandma. I'm not saying he's a hero at all, but I'm just saying that's still not right. It's not right. And I don't even know if they ever gave him an apology. Oh, that's really sad when you think about that. I mean... And when you think about how much, not just his life was destroyed, but his family's life, anybody who's connected to to him's life. Yeah. Like you're even just your name. If you were to have that name and you lived in the area, uh, there goes your reputation. Are you related to Edward? Oh, you must be related to Edward. Like, could you imagine? That's horrifying. And you know, there'd still be people going, "Mm, I still say he did it. I still say he did. I mean, we see that today. We see that today. All the time. (laughs) Yeah. All the time. Did you want to say something, John? I was going to say something, but I can't remember the school or I think it's the King Road murders. Uh, They have the primary suspect in jail and ready to go on for go on the trial. But they're still lighting up teachers and they're lighting up innocent bystanders as being the actual killer. I mean, that's what is still going on today. That's crazy. Okay, so let's get back into the case. The next break came when Louisiana authorities notified Florida authorities about an unsolved triple murder that took place in Shreveport on November 4th, 1989. There were similarities to these murders, and the victims were 55-year-old Tom Grissom, his 24-year-old daughter Julie, and Julie's 8-year-old son, Tom's grandson, Sean. The entire family had been attacked in their home as they were making dinner. Julie Grissom's body had been mutilated, cleaned, and posed again. Also, she had bite marks. They tested the body fluids found off the perpetrator and found that he had, in fact, type B blood. The worst part, the awful part, Sean was stabbed with such force, the knife went through his eight-year-old body and stuck in the floor. Shortly after Maines made this discovery, a call came into Crime Stoppers. A woman in Shreveport, Cindy Jerisich, reported that Danny Rowling was possibly connected. Three months earlier, she heard about the Florida murders, and that got her thinking about Rowling. She and her husband at the time, Steve Dobbin, had met Rowling in church. Yeah, he's a religious type. He came over every night for a while as the couples befriended him, and one night Steve came in saying, he's got to go. Apparently, Dobbin told Cindy that Rowling confessed he had a problem. And when she asked what that problem is, he replied, 
that he likes to stick knives into people. She dismissed this because she didn't want to believe he was a murderer. But then she reflected on something else he said. And I quote, One day, I'm going to leave this town and I'm going to go where the girls are beautiful and I can just lay in the sun and watch beautiful women all day. Okay, creep. Yeah, uh, I'm more concerned with I like to stick knives into people (laughs) than I want to go to the beach. Yeah, I don't know why that one wasn't the the catalyst for her. I but I don't know. I don't, but people are you know people don't want to believe the worst in people that they care about, right? So the police found Rowling quickly because he had been arrested on September seventh, nineteen ninety, for the robbery of a grocery store in Ocala, Florida, a little over the week after the last murders. And when I say quickly, I mean because of Cindy's phone call tip a very long time later, quickly after that call, not after the murders. Rowling had type B blood, and investigators believe Rowling was their guy in the Gainesville Ripper murders, as well as the Shreveport murders. There was also a bank robbery that occurred around the murders they liked him for. They found a gun, a screwdriver, a bag of money, and a cassette player in Rowling's belongings, as well as tools matching the murders. At his camp, they found diaries alluding to the murders. It was also discovered later that on August 5th, 1990, Rowling tied up another woman, Janet Freight, in Sarasota, Florida. He again used duct tape and raped her, but this woman he did not kill. That's way too close to home. Yeah, that's that's very close to where John lives. Did you know of this situation, or was this? No, new? I did. This is this this was completely new to me and shocked me when I was going through some of the research we were doing. Well, a little bit on Danny Rowling is he was born to Claudia and James. James, being a police officer and Korean War veteran, it was believed he suffered from PTSD. His father was very abusive, and as Danny got older, he got into a lot of trouble. Kicked out of the Air Force for drug possession, married, and had a daughter that he it seems in turn abused as he was as a child. He was incarcerated for a different rape of a woman who looked like his ex-wife and several armed robberies in 1979. In fact, most of the victims looked like his ex-wife. In May of 1990, Rowling shot his father in the stomach and head after another fight, but his father survived and Rowling fled to Florida. Rowling claimed he wanted to be a superstar like Ted Bundy. He actually began writing to a journalist, Sandra London, who became his fiance and helped him make the making of a serial killer. Just what? Dude, okay, so I'm going to real quick, <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys. So I watched this documentary and uh, don't watch it. It's not good. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is basically them trying to connect to his spirit. Right. And so it's very paranormal and all that good stuff. But they interview her and she tries to play it off initially kind of like that's not what it was in the beginning. Everybody made us sound like we were something. And I was like, girl, it doesn't matter if it started, ended or anything that way. The fact that it was that way after you knew. Yeah. Is not not good. Not a good look for you. Mm. I don't think I'm a fan of her journalism anymore. <laughs> Were you ever a fan of her journalism? Uh, no. no. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to make sure we clarify. Nope. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Could have won me over if it was a magnificent you know, documentary or something. <laughs> sure. But didn't happen. So he ultimately pleaded guilty to the murders, claiming his crimes truly belonged to another personality of his named Gemini. And he was sentenced to death. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and paraphilia. Also... He finally confessed to the Shreveport murders at the end. Danny Rowling was executed on October 25th, 2006 by lethal injection. And the world still doesn't miss him. Not a bit. Not nope. a bit. And then. <laughs> well, no regrets. Well, Sandra, Sandra might miss him. Do we care about Sandra? 
I was going to say, I don't know that I care about her feelings. Sandra, are you listening? I, this is better journalism than you did. <laughs> Nobody fell in love uh, during the making of this podcast. Oh, definitely not. Mm-mm. You didn't have to say it okay, quite like my that. My feelings are yeah, hurt. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> could have just left it as, oh, we, it didn't happen. But you don't want to make it like a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going home with either one of you two. So that's the um, the story of Danny Rowling. There's a little bit more to connect to the inspiration, but those are the crimes that he committed. He was a monster, an absolute monster. Now, Amanda, as someone who, as as I've said in the past, you studied psychology for a long time. Can you see in, I don't want to say empathy, but is there like an understanding? I know what you're asking. Yeah, thank God, because yeah. I don't want to ask it out loud. <laughs> Basically, you want to know if there's any level of me that can feel sympathy, empathy, or understanding of what yeah. in his past could lead him to that, right? Yeah. I, and this is my own personal belief system, I absolutely can understand how those traumatizing events could taint and distort your mind, your reality, your morality, all of that, because it can. And it's very damaging mentally, emotionally, psychologically. It is scarring. There is science behind that. Does that mean it justifies it? No, never, never is it justified or okay because of that. That will never, at least in my mind, excuse the crimes that have happened. Does it give you a base, an understanding of what we could do as a society to try to prevent more serial killers like this from being made? 100%. Like that's, that's probably the only thing that we can take out of this and say, okay, this is again, contributing to the the data and the science that these traumas can affect you. So how can we mitigate it before it becomes a problem? Right. Other than that, you still hold the accountability. You still hold the responsibility for what you did. And almost every person in the world has experienced trauma in some way or another. Of course, there are plenty who have experienced it more than others or, or in a darker way than others, and, and it should never be a competition. But some of those scars have longer and deeper lasting impacts. But that doesn't make it okay. That will never make it okay. I always find it fascinating. Uh, all the cases I've, I've studied over the years and read about over the years and watched documentaries about, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many people that can have, you're going to get two people, line them up, have the exact same experiences. One becomes a monster, like Danny Rowling. One becomes a crusader. But you can't really tell until it happens who's going to be who. And I, I just find that fascinating because the, the way that the mind works and some break and some don't. And they might have even had the same, might have grown up in the same household. You've seen brothers and sisters that grow up in the same household. And one is a very upstanding citizen and the other one becomes a monster. And they had the same or, or similar levels of abuse or trauma or whatever related to that situation. It's just, it's a fascinating thing that I don't know if we'll ever really truly understand, but it is fascinating. And I'm glad that you at least try to understand it, even if you secretly, you know, are okay if they get hit by a bus. <laughs> Let's define secretly. I mean, I'm pretty sure she's on the side <laughs> yeah. of the road with pom-poms going, get him, back him Let's up, go. back Let's it up. Let's go, L-E-T-S-G-O. <laughs> hey, let's go. That was actually a good cheer, good job. Yeah, way thank to go. you. I remember from my from my past days. We learned how to spell. Go us. I was gonna say, did did you watch <laughs> Bring It On one too many times? A hundred thousand percent. God, I'd rather watch that than scream right now. Currently, just because I, yeah. I gotta get this case out washed out of my system mm. before. So that's Danny Rowling, and now I'm gonna tell you how it inspired Scream. So in 1994, a struggling writer named Kevin Williamson agreed to watch a friend's house and his dog for 20 bucks. He was watching a show on ABC about this case. Late that night, he found a window wide open that he was certain it had been closed the last time he checked. Now, he believed there was someone in the house. Williamson called a friend as he searched the house, and his friend kept teasing him that Jason was there with a knife. The kind of thing... You know, all of us assholes would do. John. Aaron. <laughs> and he and his best friend talked horror movies as he searched the house. 
And then he was inspired. Not to write the Gainesville Ripper, as it were, but to write about how terrified he felt as he watched those details unravel and the dots began to connect for him. That's what I think is fascinating about doing this podcast and went on is inspiration is different than based on inspiration means it it can be, you can get a lot of truth out of it, or it can be just being inspired to, to create something new. And I find that fascinating because this is a horrible, horrible case that inspired someone to make a movie that, yes, I know there are horrific elements, but have entertained millions going on 30 years. Yeah, I, oh man, I have so many thoughts and feelings on this. It's so interesting to me, though, the way that we look at horror movies Mm -hmm. and how, you know, we take them and implement them, even a small, tiny concept, like you said, even if it's just like a little nibble of the crumb into entertainment. But other historical depictions of events, we're fine with seeing people get murdered and mutilated and tortured there. But in a different genre, we feel very different about it. Oh, it's true. Because if it's based on something real and true, if it's actually like supposed to be the real victims, there's it's not really an entertainment, right? It hits you more in the gut. Watching something like Scream, there's jokes, there's pop culture references, there's it's entertainment. It's entertaining. You smile, you laugh as people are being mur- the whole opening with the phone call and Drew Barrymore going back and forth, you know, with the, we're having a great kick out of that, right? It's completely different and very, very interesting how we look at things differently. Horror movies make really, really horrible things almost acceptable during the course of that two hours. They also remind you of the terror that exists in the world or could exist in the world, right? Because not every horror movie is based in reality, or maybe you don't subscribe to the belief in like paranormal or things like that. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that was a special comment for you. Specifically. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep, 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 yep. Um, but when you when you're experiencing those, you're going through the terror yourself. But I feel like at least for me, and maybe this is just like a lady thing, I feel like it opens my eyes. Like I learn what things I should look out for because if one person has thought about it, they were probably inspired from something else too. Like, let's be real. Every piece of entertainment is, it's that brainstorming idea comes from something. There's something that creates a light switch and you're like, ah, that would be a really cool idea with this, 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 or this would be really interesting. Or I would love to write about this. So everything comes from something. Mm-hmm. And so there's always reality in some level into horror movies where, and, and slashers specifically, because it's like almost like I get to compete with this character and figure out, am I going to live based on my own decisions in this moment? Or am I also going to die hypothetically in my mind, right? Oh, I'd live every so time. I feel like I get prepared every time even more. I swear to God, every, whatever the best thing, that's what I'm doing. All right. I am running I, as soon as, oh, the lights went out. I'm out. You know, oh, there's something in the basement. I'm out. Oh, the car won't start. I'm running. You know, I'm not going to, just none of that stuff is going to work on me. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm out. I, I will have no problem abandoning everyone I came to the party with. I right. just don't care. One of your friends is a murderer. Okay, sorry, Troy. Stab, 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 stab. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Gotta be safe. <laughs> Gotta be safe. Why is it always Troy? I don't know, but it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And here's where I want to kind of like segue to a really, I think, interesting question. You heard how horrible that story is, right? He did horrible things to these women and, and men. He just did horrible things to people. Then we go and watch a slasher movie and enjoy. And I'm just being honest. That's what it is, right? It's entertainment. If you go and you keep going to these, you enjoy them on some level. Enjoy watching these things happen to other people. Now, you kind of talked about it to a certain degree, but hearing all those crimes and then watching something like Scream, do you feel like we shouldn't be enjoying this? On some level, we should not be enjoying this. It's an honest question. It's a it's a real tough call. I mean... All of us are human beings, we ha- we share one trait which that no other creature on the planet shares, which is we like 
to scare one another and we like to be scared. No other creature likes this because mm-hmm. usually that fear is something that's used for for their safety and security. You don't see two raccoons, one raccoon jump out of the from behind a tree with a knife and go ha and the other raccoon's like ah! The raccoon lifts his mask off and he says, "Hey, it's just me, Bob. It wasn't that funny." That doesn't happen in real life. God, that would be amazing if it did, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. <laughs> that would be great. I, I would be my millions and my finally, I'd be going viral over, over something if I had that video. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Yeah, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, Aaron, Aaron knows this very intimately. Lately, <laughs> he's a meme. If anybody didn't know, we have developed. Since the beginning of cinema, since the beginning of storytelling, this enjoyment of being afraid. And it's because in most of our everyday lives, we don't have that fear. So when you sit there and say, well, this story is based off of a true story, do you still feel the same way because that true story is horrific in one way or shape or another? Well, it, makes, it just amps up the fear even more. It's just it's just a, a pure form of cocaine that we're taking in to be afraid a little bit. So is it okay? I'm fine with it. I don't want to see the murders themselves, but I'll see somebody fake being murdered like this. Oh, I, I, I've thought and thought thought about this, and obviously I'm okay with it because, uh, sadly, slashers are my favorite genre. Now, does this make me feel a little guilty about that? Absolutely. <laughs> it does. But there are so many things that are captured in movies. I just don't subscribe to the theory that movies make monsters. I think monsters are made in different ways. Well, even with Danny Rowling, you have the the fact that he st- stood up and said, I wanted to be the next Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. I want to be as important as Ted Bundy. He didn't say, I want to be Michael Myers or I want to be Jason Voorhees because let's face it, their numbers aren't as good as some of the actual serial killers out there. He said, I wanted to be Ted Bundy. And honestly, I don't believe that. I think it's something you say later, but the way that The crimes happened, what happened, how vicious they were, what he did to that eight-year-old boy. That's that's not somebody who wants to be Ted Bundy. That's somebody who's sick. That's somebody who's twisted. I felt like that was a scapegoat because what better way to turn the attention off of you than in every instance possible subverting any accountability, Mm -hmm. right? Because he's saying, oh, well, this was Gemini. I was possessed. Or he's saying, well, it's because of my childhood. Or he's saying it's because of, you know what I mean? Like the list goes on and on of what these excuses are, of what led to these actions. Or I I was inspired by Ted Bundy. I wanted to be Ted Bundy, whatever. All you're doing in those moments is trying to remove your role in all of this. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And your role at the end of all of this has nothing to do with Ted Bundy. It has nothing to do with slasher movies. It has nothing to do with being demonically possessed. Because if that were, if even the possession were a real thing that was occurring to him, that I guess the demon just makes, possesses him at all different sorts of times of the day. And then he gets to come back to himself conveniently outside of the murders. But he can go back and forth. I'm going to come back because I forgot my wallet. The demon made him do that too. You know what I mean? Like that is so, that is so, just so dark and disgusting. And all I feel like those comments are for is to say, look at those people though. What about Ted Bundy though? Think about how horrific he is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the way I interpret it. I I would, I agree a hundred percent. I agree. And it's just uh, those, those poor victims and, you know, here's one thing we do in this podcast. You know, I know if you've listened to a lot of true crime, there is a lot of gap filling, I will say, where it is almost written as a play and there there's a lot of embellishment in what happened. So-and-so thought this, so-and-so did this, so-and-so, you know, whatever it was to increase the, the angst and build suspense and enjoyability. That's not something that we're doing here just because I believe the facts are, are enough. You know, the, the details are, are enough. I don't need to embellish. Embellishing takes away from the real weight of what this particular horrible man did. I don't need to embellish that. I don't need anyone to think, God, well, how much of that was ac- accurate? That's the whole point of this podcast. That was all accurate. Research to hell. That was all accurate. That's what this man did. 
He's a monster, plain and simple. And he does want to blame everybody but himself. He did find religion. He was very or searching for religion, whatever, maybe to try and justify to himself that he can be forgiven, that, you know, it's not going to damn him forever if he finds God. I don't know. And I'm definitely not blaming religion. That's not the case. It's just he was somebody desperate to blame someone else. That whole bit about finding religion is always cracks me up. There's a joke that I see, I heard from a comedian once, and I'd love to give him credit for it, but it's always stuck in my mind when it comes to these criminals who's like, I found religion. Oh, yeah, when'd you find it? Well, pretty much right when they put me in the police car and handcuffs on. He yeah, was, he was sitting right. right next to me. It's about right. Yeah, good, good timing, right? When I'm trying to avoid execution. Right. All right, so now let's move a little bit more into Scream. So as a standalone movie without any real knowledge of the case, I assume we're all big fans of Scream, right? This has stood the test of time. We already talked about Amanda. You love it. John, you're a big fan? I'm a moderately okay fan with this. I, it's, it's never really been one of my favorite movies, but I have enjoyed it over the years several different times. What about the Drew Barrymore portion? I mean, I just want, we're going to hit some some greatest hits on this movie. So the beginning with Drew Barrymore was a game changer at the time because going in, you believe she was the star of the movie. And it was a shock how early she died. Do either of you remember this? Amanda, I'm guessing not. I don't remember it in theaters, but I sure <laughs> shit remember. <laughs> uh, for context, I was three years old when this movie came out. But It'd be when awesome I did if you watch... were like, yeah, that was my favorite part. I remember sitting in the theater going, what? like, what? What the hell happened to music I, I did watch this from a, at a very, very young age. And... You know, it never really traumatized me. There were, there was one night where I didn't have a good night of dreams, but that was one time. And that was because I watched it like repeatedly over and over again. And I thought about the ghost face getting in my room and there was like six of them and I had a bunk bed and I just kept thinking that they were going to come for me because I was on the top. Anyway, oh. so where I'm going with this, I guess, is I do remember how quick it was that she died and being shocked at how how perfectly written that shock was and how witty and interesting and f and funny for for a horror movie like i'm not supposed to be laughing right now mm -hmm. or i'm not supposed to have this feeling of entertainment so you, you almost feel a level of guilt while watching it too because you're like ooh am i supposed to me am I, like is this a joke it's okay for me to laugh at but this was also like the 90s and 2000s so more acceptable Ah, the good old days. I don't remember ever sitting there and saying that I'm surprised Drew Barrymore is dead. I always equate the whole setup like the first 20 minutes of When a Stranger Calls. Me too. Thank you. I was going to mention that movie, but go ahead. Yeah. And that movie is a movie that I watched at a very formidable age, and that one scared the bejesus out of me. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is very cool because this is a homage to When a Stranger Calls and they're do they were executing it fairly well. And even to a degree where it was almost better than the original because of, it, of the lightness that it still carried with it. Man, the, the first 20 minutes of that movie or 10 minutes, however long that was, I think it was, it was a good chunk of time though. Uh, that is probably, if you've never seen it, one of the most terrifying scenes in movie history. My it really is. Have you ever seen the sequel to that one? Yeah, it's actually not bad. It's actually very good. And, and it's almost they found a way to make it actually so nearly scarier than the first one. When a stranger calls back. Yeah. They just threw a word on it. They right. didn't even try to put a two on there. Have you seen the remake? Avoid it. It's not Avoid it. Not, nothing like that movie. Yeah. No good. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> Avoid the remake. I saw this on opening night. And I remember... I didn't know how big a part Drew Barrymore was, but I immediately assumed, oh, well, she's going to get away. I mean, it's going to be one of those things where there's a killer on the loose and got her boyfriend. Oh, crap. She's going to get out of there. It's going to be fine. Parents are going to get home. And no, she did not make it. And it was quite the shocker because Drew Barrymore was a fairly well-known name. And I was a big fan of Drew Barrymore. I, I loved her as Gertie. I grew up with her as a kid. Uh -huh. <gasps> you killed Gertie? It's just a well-done flip of the script in many ways and then i would say nev campbell was perfectly cast pay her the money by the way yeah she's worth it all of the money <laughs> and by i don't think you quite understand me when i say all of the money i mean all of the money think bacon and eggs if you get the reference I, nope don't 
at all. What? Never Ron mind. Swanson. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just caught John! on. No, I, you're right. <laughs> I, I caught on right at the end. My brain said, hey, dummy, it's Ron Swanson. I'm like, oh, right. Right. <laughs> All the bacon you have. Man. But anyway, sorry. I'm glad we're not writing movies about pop culture references because we apparently <laughs> suck at it. Right. <laughs> Speaking of the pop culture references, we're more than throwaway. It's something a lot, most horror movies miss, especially after this came out. And so many movies tried to do the same formula. They just couldn't really capture the magic of it. These actually directed the plot. They were very believable in terms of how people like all three of us would have conversations during a situation like this. And I truly believe that those are the kinds of conversations we would have as movie fans. No, no, it's totally true. I, 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 there's that scene where Stu leaves the party and he's like, I'll be right back. <laughs> and, you know, just to, just to, you know, drive some other people nuts who are talking about what the rules of a horror movie are. You know, there's so many aspects I, uh, of what this movie did that made it great. Even the whole bit about Nev Campbell being the final girl and the way she m- might or might not have lost her final girl status. Just well done. For me personally, Randy was like the character oh, that I think all of us could like really identify with. Anybody right? who worked in a video store or movie theater, man, <laughs> absolutely. Go Randy. Mm-hmm. You're still mad they killed him in the second one. Fuck you. <laughs> that part so much but he was such a great character because he was a completely real and he thought he didn't just think or act in a way that we are thinking as an audience member but he said those things like anytime we would be like what a cliche randy's already out here calling it he's already (laughs) like hey guys hold on a second like these people are automatically (laughs) going to die um Please be aware of this situation. Obviously, don't have sex. And what does everyone do? Has sex. Right. And like we <laughs> and all it's would. Just, yeah. Yeah, 100%. But he was the character that most people, I think, could identify with. And it, and it made it so, I guess, like inviting into the world, right? Mm. Where you're like, I can see myself like as that person. I connect with him so much. And that's why it was so emotional for me when he died, because I I just loved his character so much. Still breaks my heart. I I love the part where he's like, this is the part in the movie where the killer jumps back up for the final scare. That was great. Because you're like, oh, okay, you know what? This is, but you know, we're finding out this is a real situation. There's no way that's going to happen. And then they commit. Unfortunately, they did that joke to death in the sequels, but still. Right. Uh, it's amazing to me how cavalier people are in the original when this is going on. And then I, I often think about, well, people react with humor all the time to tragedy. So how far how far off is it really? It really actually kind of feels pretty genuine. I know when horrible things are going on, even when people pass away, we're, we're joking to try and lighten the load for whoever's going through the, the suffering portion. I think it's pretty natural. I mean, what is the... There's a there's a certain line about it, but basically, like comedy is healing. Like that is a coping, a true coping mechanism for a lot of people. And that dark humor, while it's not, I guess, politically correct or acceptable in in today's society, mm. more than likely, it's still something that I think a lot of people, not everybody, obviously, but people who grew up around that dark humor and and who are more accept- accepting to it. You're thinking that or you're feeling that all the time in your head, even if that's just innate to you. And that's the environment that you've been around. And whether it's dark humor or it's light humor, we all, I think, at some point feel joy and relief through comedy and that that comedy can bring us healing. It can bring us to question things we never used to think about or question would have questioned without that joke or that bit or whatever it may be. But comedy is there to heal us, to educate us, to move us, to, I mean, it just has so many different avenues that it can take. And it has a true ability to change and impact us as human beings. You know, I, I've met very many first responders, uh, both in the you know, when it came to being, you know, fire departments and police. And sometimes those guys are the funniest people I, I've met because they have the ability of just shrugging 
almost everything they can off with comedy. And that's the best way, the best coping mechanism that they've had to be able to get through it. So I don't see a difference in in what they're doing because they're seeing most people at their their worst more often than the rest of us. And I and I get it. I get why they do it because otherwise they would be, you know, underneath their car, hiding, rolling around back and forth, going, I don't want to do this anymore. Why have you met so many police officers and fire responders? I mean, are are you burning your house down a lot? No, I just I work <laughs> I work out with a lot of them. I you know. Oh. Oh, oh, this is like a strip club. I get it. Yeah, you know, I it's a strip it. club. Y-M-C-A. I mean, I CA. My phone number is beep 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 beep. <laughs> Moving beep, beep, on. Beep, beep beep beep. I mean, they said they said they're firefighters. I mean, but they, I I don't I never understood why that he's always wearing a speedo. <laughs> What kind of firefighters are you hanging out with? This is definitely a strip club. Yeah. All right. Well, this film also launched the careers of Skeet Ulrich, David Arquette. Uh, Roger Jackson has been the voice of, of Ghostface through all these movies. Matthew Lillard, of course, who went on to become wonderful Shaggy. And also elevated Courtney Cox to quite acclaim. Got to give a shout out to Gail Weathers. Love the name. <laughs> Gail Weathers. Hilarious. Yeah. Clever. I don't know why she's not doing the weather. Right, exactly. It's just weird. Gale Force winds and weathers, okay. And then you got Dewey, David Arquette, wonderful as Dewey. Still sad that he's gone, but I love Dewey. What a delight. But really, the reveal of two murderers was brilliant, both by Kevin Williamson, how he wrote it, and also how Wes Craven directed it, because there's a lot of things that put us off the scent, right? And I can tell you, most people I know, I don't know anyone that guessed it right off the bat. I don't think I do either. I don't think I do either. And then my favorite part was when you got Stu, uh, Skeet, and Randy. You got the three of them sitting there talking about the other person being the killer. And it always reminds me of the Spider-Man meme where they're all pointing at each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair point. So what did you think of this concept of two murders? Now, I will say, again, sequels have done this to death. Beat it to the ground. I wish they would just, you know, come up with something different. I guess they did in the most recent one, but I don't think that was a good answer. So what what do you think about this concept and how groundbreaking it was at the time? I loved it. Two people who you couldn't believe would be the killers because they were not obvious in any sort of way shape or form one of them you thought was on death door and the whole process you know there's just so much going on and then finally when the reveal is done they kind of amp it up to even show just how ridiculous they were in their thinking and planning uh stew you know are you, you gonna get us in trouble my mom's gonna be so mad at me oh i love that <laughs> line it's so good mom and dad the line is mom and dad are gonna be so mad at me yeah matthew lillard was just genius i tell you stop hitting me with the phone dick <laughs> You know, the thing for me with this is also how brilliantly they had it in our face and they did it. Williamson did it so smart because he's he's letting you know, hey, this person, I want you to believe I want you to invest time into us changing your mind. We want you to suspect that he's the killer, Mm -hmm. but then we want to change your mind and, and subvert your attention to someone else. And so what better way to put the killer in in your vision in your understanding of like who the potentials could be than literally smack dab in the in the in front of your face and saying, "Yep, this person is the killer. He is going to be arrested for it, all that good stuff." And then you just move on and you kind of forget that oh yeah, like he he was definitely being accused for murder and I bought into him not being the killer after time because they were so smart about it. I thought it was just brilliant. Just brilliant. So what the movie got right and did it respect the victims? Uh, this one really, really isn't telling the story. Again, this is really a movie that was just inspired by horrible things. The murders, uh, there are some pretty graphic murders. Uh, you do have Casey is, her intestines are hanging out. So that's definitely uh, some reminiscence, I guess, to the crimes, but overall it's really just a, a mass murderer. That's really the only connection. And that that's been done a lot of times in slasher movies. So I wouldn't really, 
say that it got anything right or wrong. Uh, respecting the victims, it's hard to say that when it comes to a slasher movie of any kind because we sh- we have to admit, even though we can in- and say it's okay to enjoy it, it's also you know a little disturbing that we enjoy it to some degree. I'm all right with it. <laughs> He's okay with it. Yeah, well, I'm all right with it because I know this is fantasy, and I know yep, the whole absolutely. time this is fantasy. You know, if this was if this was something where they were like, "This is the actual story of the Gainesville Ripper," different story entirely. Sure, this is what I love about how inspiration works, and the Kevin Williamson did as far as acknowledging the fact that this moment crystallized so much in his mind in the way of inspiration that he had no choice but to divulge this is where it came from. You know, it came from the Gainesville Ripper. And that, I think, is what the beautiful part of inspiration is. He couldn't help but talk about how it affected him. The In terms of respect, so here's what I would say about this. I think it absolutely did respect its victims because it didn't pull a lot from the original crimes. I think because this was a movie that had intention of being entertaining, it did do right by the victims by not gratuitously bringing the real s- crimes into the screen for us. I would have felt like it would have been disrespectful if it would have been made, I guess, I don't want to say something to enjoy, but kind of like if if it would have been made in an entertainment purpose intention, that would have made me feel gross about it versus this way. What we're what we're getting is, oh, this sparked an idea for you that scared you. And it made you think about all of the other potential. And then you created your own story. You left these victims alone. You know, when you look at a lot of the, you know, inspired by Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy stories, right? A lot of them who try to stick to the actual source of, uh, of what happened, they don't handle it like a slasher film, though it'd be easy to handle it like a slasher film. They handle it more more respectfully and if they did something like that with scream it would take away from it would take away from the enjoyment of it what would you have done differently would you guys have done anything anything different is there anything about scream that you would do differently even now knowing the case that inspired it no no nothing no okay no it, beautiful movie well it calm down in a weird way i don't, I don't i'm sorry that sounds really that sounds really messed up i don't mean it like that i mean as a film as a film fan a you film love that movie. I get it. yes either way calm down um <laughs> <laughs> you, you calm down with your attitude <laughs> i was gonna say I, i'm agreeing with you that we don't need to change anything about scream to make it any sort of okay. any but i'm agreeing with that but let's yeah good point yeah, yeah. i mean period and right there. right okay I'll, i'm gonna walk away before <laughs> i'm just just kidding. I'm just kidding. Feels right. It feels like you're done. Yeah, there's nothing I would have done. This is one of the few movies where I would say it's pretty close to perfect for what it is, right? For what it's trying to do, for what it's trying to achieve as a film, I think it's pretty spot on. And it did reinvent horror in many ways for better and worse. Wonderful horror film. And Wes Craven just goes to prove once again, guy's a master. Absolute master. He's got so many 100%. classics under his belt. Oh, so many. Has been missed because he would have been Absolutely. able to reinvent horror mm-hmm. yet again. Yes, he would. Yep. Yes, he would. 100%. Yep. And, you know, before we go, there are a couple of cases where, you know, movies don't make psychos. They make psychos more creative where there are uh, a few people who use Scream as their backdrop for their own murders. We didn't cover those because we don't think that's pertinent to what we're talking about here on this podcast. And also, I don't want to give more credence to people trying to use a movie for fame, you know, or as an excuse to get out of the crimes they committed. But there are those, if you want to go research them, we just didn't want to talk about them on this particular podcast. That's not really what the mo- what the podcast is about. This podcast is about movies that were inspired by crimes, not that inspired maniacs to do maniacal things. All right. Well, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share the show on your social media outlets and uh, give us a review on your favorite podcast app. That's helpful. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever it is. You are the best source of promotion. So please tell your true crime maniac friends about it. That's how people find the podcast uh, the the most. That's the best promotion that we can ask for. And uh, thank you for listening to Inspired by a True Story. And thank uh, Amanda and John for joining me on the ride. 
thank you guys so much for listening. And this is always fun for me. I'm so happy that we got to talk about one of my favorite movies, but I'm devastated that I'll never be able to watch it the same again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what are you going to do? Yeah. Did I say always fun? (laughs) Yeah, we've got some dark ones, but we have some other lighter ones that are coming up on the horizon, too. We do? They're not as dark. Um, This was pretty brutal. This was pretty brutal. I mean, I think we're doing Monster soon, and that's not really a uh, Disney film. Think about the other one, though. Oh, we're going to do Catch Me If You Can soon. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, that one's great. Lighter. Yeah, that's lighter. It's it's DiCaprio. You can't go bad with DiCaprio, right? Can't go wrong with him. I mean, unless you get a bear involved. Or a boat. (laughs) 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 All right, that's going to do it for Inspired by a True Story. Now lock your doors, check your windows, hide your phone, and let's keep those artists on us. I like that. Exit. Except you probably need your phone to call 911. Uh, Yeah, I was thinking about that, too. I was like, why would I hide my phone? They can't. I guess if they can't call you and you have these stupid back and forth banter, then they won't break in. That, you know what? That is true. I don't have to have like, imagine if your own like Amber Alert basically went off on your phone and you weren't able to silence it and that's how you got murdered. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> oh, man. How would that work? Somebody reported you missing, but you're not missing, but you are missing? <laughs> no, no, no. Not, not like an actual, but like, uh, look out for this killer guy. Oh. This guy, You know what I mean? Like, oh, he's in my house. I called the police. And then they're like, all right, ma'am, we're on the way. Stay on the line. And then all of a sudden, your phone just starts going, beep. <laughs> and he's like, oh, specifically, you're right there. <laughs> Found you. I think you overthought this so much. I did. Yeah. I did. Too deep. <laughs>